Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and welcome uh, to this Fusion uh, 21 uh, webinar, Reimagining the Future, a Roadmap to Zero Carbon. Um, I'm uh, Andrew Gray. I'm Member Relationships Manager at Fusion 21. And again, I hopefully uh, you will uh, enjoy today's uh, presentations. We've brought together a panel. Um, we were just been having a, a chat whilst uh, waiting uh, for you all to join. And clearly, uh, this webinar is timely with the um, Chancellor's announcement of, we think, £1 billion of energy efficiency measures for uh, public, public sector building. So it's really timely and hopefully we've, we've got a good panel uh, to discuss um, how uh, they can assist you in, and share their thoughts in terms of uh, how we achieve zero carbon. If any of you aren't familiar uh, with this uh, web, uh, webinar um, uh, software, if you point at the orange button uh, at the top, you can minimize um, the, the, the panel uh, and therefore see more of the presentation and more of uh, the, the speakers. Um, if you are having problems with your audio, then again, if you click on the audio tab, you should be able to uh, make changes to your audio settings, which hopefully um, should um, solve those, uh, those issues. And then finally, we do want you, whilst you as the audience are on mute, uh, we do want you to try and participate as much as you can. And if you use uh, the questions uh, tab, you'll be able to uh, answer, uh, to, sorry, to ask your questions uh, there. And we will do our best both during the courses of the presentations, but, but if not, uh, uh, we can always follow up uh, afterwards if we don't get through um, all, of, uh, all of the questions. So uh, without um, uh, further ado, um, it now uh, over to, to me to um, introduce uh, our panel. And we're delighted uh, that we have uh, Patrick, uh, AJ, uh, and Michael. Uh, Patrick uh, from the University of, of, of West of England, uh, Associate Head uh, of, de of Department uh, there. AJ Eaton is a Divisional uh, Director at MySpace, uh, and Michael uh, is the Sustainability Manager at Riverside. I'm just going to keep those introductions uh, very, very brief. Um, and uh, what we're now going to do is, is hand over uh, to Patrick. I'm going to give Patrick, uh, hopefully, a control um, of the keyboard, and he will get on with his presentation. So welcome, Patrick, and um, uh, over, to, over to you. Thank you, Andrew. So uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome. I'm going to give you a quick 20-minute uh, introduction to myself, and then three main tips on kind of how the attributes of a of a zero carbon client so um let's hopefully click my way through this one here we go just a little bit about me not too much um but i i yes an academic from the university west of england associate head of department looking after partnerships so we have partnerships around the world in hong kong and oman and sri lanka and also regional partnerships uh in terms of working with businesses and working with uh, further education colleges we're one of only two universities in the uk that have uh, programs for every discipline of the built environment. So you see a list of our 11 programs down along there on, on the right-hand side and nine undergraduate programs. I won't mention the other university, they can do their own marketing. Um, but my, my background is in building service engineer. So I was in practice as an electrical building service engineer for a number of years, looking at pharmaceutical plants and uh, airport developments and office developments. And then I did a master's in sustainability at the West School of Architecture in 2007. And since 2009, I've been an academic here at UWE. Again, one of the biggest um, schools of architecture and built environment in the country with two and a half thousand students and over a hundred members of staff. My core team is around eight people uh, to, to do with building service engineering, but then each of the other disciplines will have similar teams involved there as well. Um, we, we're kind of used to pitching this sustainability and energy efficiency to different groups within our students. So whether they're the real estate people or the art people or the technology people, or the environment people or the history people or the computer people, you know, all the various backgrounds, we kind of learn how to pitch a little bit differently. So I'm, I've tried to pitch it here to a client in the public sector who's interested in thinking about zero carbon and some of the key attributes. That's what my, my goal is uh, in this presentation today. Uh, there we go. 
So the, the, one of the main reasons I was invited along today is because during lockdown, I've been running this uh, online free CPD course, which has got a very good feedback. Uh, and it basically um, aims at it's five weeks long, seven and a, an hour and a half per week. Uh, and it, it aimed all disciplines and all experiences talking about zero carbon uh, building design. So there's the, the, the five weeks. And from that, I've tried to boil down some of the key points um, of discussions uh, for you today to look at uh, 15 minutes as we have about left. Uh, and the three bits I've picked on are the skills and incentives you should make sure are part of your project team. That's just not just the narrow definition of your personal employees within the client, but then the wider team as well, including the designer and the contractor. Um, a mature attitude towards risk when considering life cycle costings. So when you get a costing from a designer or from a, um, a contractor, just knowing what's real cost and what's actually kind of associated with uh, the unknown. And then um, maintain maintenance issues. Of course, a big issue with uh, um, the clients we have here is, is that unlike a speculative office developer or housing uh, developer, you actually live with your buildings long term. So you have much more interest in maintainability and ensuring that that's a big issue. So those are the three key themes I've picked out for, for my little section here. So one, the first one is looking at to ensure that your project team has the skills and incentives to deliver zero carbon. So we, we, we cover one entire session, an hour and a half. We, we tell the story of the eight stages of development that we use here in the UK and the, the various at each stage, uh, the various kind of positive collaborations and negative behaviors that could kind of increase the chances or decrease the chances of just better performing building. Never mind zero carbon building, but just better performing building. And we talk about the kind of easier early decisions that are made that, that could have zero cost implication, but just put us on a trajectory towards better performance if we knew more about energy efficiency and more about the funding that's available and things like that. And then, okay, the extra steps that need to go to actually make it zero carbon. So we spend a lot of time uh, talking about those over the various stages. Uh, the key things here is is um, making sure that what, before you're appointing a design team that you ha you're actually getting independent advice as to how to communicate to them uh, eff efficiently uh, to make sure that if they have clear targets that you want them to hit. So uh, Reba run a, uh, a session of independent advisors to help clients set out their brief. So they put those brief to a number of design teams um, and uh, uh, for bidding to make sure that it's crystal clear what you want them to price for. A lot of the time, if it's unclear what you're asking them to price for, uh, they might miss it and you might assume that they, they, they are going to do activities they haven't priced for. That's quite a common thing that happens in industry. So actually just a very clear day one brief from the client um, that has been informed by, by independent advisors can, can really make, be the making of a, of a good project all the way through. I point out a very interesting initiative that's been uh, making a lot of noise there the last 12 months, the London Energy Transformation Initiative. They've been working at this type of uh, performance specification. How, how would you uh, specify a, a large scale um, housing development? And they do a one page post and say you can put this performance spec to, to uh, um, a stage one document and then the, the, the designers would know what your targets are aimed for. It's quite an interesting approach uh, to, to clarify that communication. The other part, the part is um, to consider maybe incentivizing higher performance. So if, if you're really cutthroat on the design side, then you're, you're almost rewarding the people who are going to do basic design to minimum standards. You know, they're going to, they don't have enough hours in there to maybe compare, contrast newer technologies or, you know, uh, uh, test new methods of, of installation. So obviously we don't want to have to pay extra and then not get the building in, uh, at the end. So is there any way we can have kind of performance related incentives that if at the end we have to our post occupancy, we find we have got a easier building to maintain lower bills. Is there any reward there for the designer having, having, um, or even the contractor having uh, been all part of that? So is there kind of some way to share the success, uh, but, but reduce the risk at the same time? So there are me methods in there of, of perhaps performance related uh, contracts. And then again, don't don't assume the designers and the contracts contractors already know about zero carbon. If you want them to consider that when they're returning their bids, so the designer returning their bids at the end of stage uh, one, um, make sure it's clear that you want them to consider uh, zero carbon. They may have that expertise in-house. They may consider developing that as part of this project, or they may have to hire in an expensive consultant. And if it's not clear what what you're asking them to do um, and they have missed this in their bid then then uh, that's the start of a project not going particularly well um, and, and you know uh, the best chances of zero carbon happening on a project is that you, it, it goes according to budget and according to time 
And if for any reason we start missing out, then it's things like zero carbon will get squeezed at the end. So just a well-run project could be one of the main keys to delivering zero carbon uh, rather, than, uh, rather than anything else. So that's the kind of main point to ensure that you have the skills yourself within your, your client team, but also that you ensure that you're putting in very clearly when you're pointing to the design team and appointing the contractor, what skills you intend them to ha have um, so that they can, they can uh, discuss that accordingly. My next two points are going to be uh, relating to uh, costing. So the two, sorry, uh, it's coming out split here it was, it was uh, when I transferred it across. Um, but the two main costing points, so just before you appoint a designer and just before you appoint a, co a contractor and kind of um, how to deal with risk in, at that point. And then we're going to talk about maintenance issues towards the end and the life cycle, how to make sure that you have a low maintenance building as well as anything else. So when you get a quote from uh, either a designer uh, um, at the early stages, here's the, here's the price of your zero carbon building, or later on in the process when you're appointing a contractor and they, you get in a range of prices, that price for zero carbon can contain many different aspects in there. Yes, the technical aspects you're assuming, so if you're asking for better insulation, more air tightness, higher than building regs, you're going for maybe passive house standard or whatever it is, you would expect to pay more for that, but there, there's ways to offset that. There's fundings you can get, there's um, uh, the, the, and, and it, it's more likely to pay itself back, particularly for new build. I think there's a great case for higher performance standards over building regs for new build. Much more difficult for retrofit. Uh, we had this discussion just before we came on. You know, there's there's issues there with um, kind of the, the easier retrofit having maybe been mined out a lot of it, and the the, the moisture issues, which um, a lot of people don't understand when you try to uh, retrofit uh, fabric insulation. So there's maybe issues there that uh, that make it more difficult. Then there's more effective services. So a lot of the time we're taking out services as well. So it's replacement. So we're saving from not putting in boilers and radiators by putting in maybe MVHR or whatever the technology is. Um, there's sometimes, and there's funding available for that as well to offset that general cost. So when you when you see your price, have they really explored all the all fundings that are out there to try to help you to, to make the whole thing more feasible? And one point to note is that um, it is now more and more likely that heat pumps are going to replace boilers on a mass scale in, in dwellings um, that uh, both London and Birmingham, uh, Bristol and Wales, I discovered uh, the, uh, the other day, have all now agreed that by 2030, no new buildings uh, will be on gas. They'll all be electric. And by 2050, there'll be no gas, so effectively shutting down the gas mains in 2050. So those th that's coming down the line. And for us to hit those targets, we really have to be radically changing now. So uh, we cover all this in the short course, going through discussions on how this uh, might be. And because I have over uh, a 1,000 people on that short course, I do a lot of kind of um, crowdsourcing to get the opinions of everyone. And it seems to be a very common opinion across a, a large uh, scale, a sector of people that that's the way we're going. And then the last one, cost of renewables. Um, uh, I, I do think that what, like fabric and, and better services, but then when you look at the renewables as well, there's, there's a price for that. And that's probably the easiest to get funding for as well. Um, and whether we put them on the building or regionally close to the building, a little bit offsetting, there's, there's a case there to be made for that. So that's a, those three will be included in the price you get, as well as additional skills and additional uh, on design and additional skills for site. You would expect that, but we've gone through that before. We went through it with BIM. We went through it with health and safety. Anytime you try to do something new, there will be an additional price and then the market will adjust and, and bring that back down again. But the one thing that will sometimes really throw out that price is the last one, the risk of the unknown. So it's where the contractor or the design team who are bidding for that work, they may tell you at stage two, oh, the price of zero carbon is 15% more. How, how, how real is that price? How much of that percentage is these first five? And how much of it is actually the last one? And we find that actually a lot of the time, this last one has inflated that price quite a lot. Uh, a good example uh, is um, the Goldsmith Street um, building. Many of you probably heard of, of, won the Sterling Prize last year. It's a social housing, 100 developments done to the Passive House standard. I've went to the presentation on this and there wasn't any particular new things there in terms of technical. What really impressed me was the role of Norwich City Council, because when Norwich City Council got their first quote, it was high and inflated. And they talked to their architect and they said, let's just go for it anyway. And it actually turned out significantly less. I don't know the exact numbers, but something like 8% rather than the 15% they were initially quoted was the real cost of, of, of adding that, which was much more feasible when you had a high performing building. So just knowing that that, that role of the unrisk, uh, that risk, 
price of the unrisk often inflates that initial cost. So when you get that cost from the designers and you're, you're tempted to go, oh, I can't afford that, or when you get that ten, uh, cost from the contractors at stage four and you go, oh, I don't know if I can afford that, just, just make sure um, that you, you have a little bit more uh, a nuance about whether there's risk involved there or whether it's a real cost. Um, so that's the second point. So the first point was making sure you have the skills and knowledge in the team. Second point was understanding the role risk plays and when you get quotes. And the third one then is just about maintenance and sustainability. I have a saying, if it's not maintainable, it's not sustainable. And this is something that I imagine the audience who's tuning in today are very interested in and making sure that uh, their buildings are maintainable. I, I, everyone knows the story of the buildings that got handed over and were the maintenance nightmare, you know. Um, and we have processes now for trying to reduce that risk. So over the stages of development, uh, we are now asking all the players to contribute to a risk register and a responsibility matrix so that if we do get a bad building, it's very transparent going back who made what decision when, whose responsibility was it to make sure that maintenance was carried through. And so transparency across the whole thing is, is becoming a big part of all all um, the the, mod, the developments in zero carbon and in just build, uh, general changes to like uh, the REBA stages of work, uh, making sure that that's clear so that if we do get a bad building, we can learn the lessons from it. Um, the other is having a very clear meeting at stage two when the when the this, this main building has has its shape and you get the client coming in going, I no, I don't want that's going to cause more maintenance or that's going to be work. Really, stage two is where you get to admit, change your mind. A poor client will keep changing their mind into stages three and four. A good client will do all their changes in stage two and, and be very reluctant to change their mind into the later stages because the, the heavy engineering, the heavy procurement work has started and to redo that is very expensive. So uh, again, another a, a well-run project has a better chance of success and not squeezing out things like zero carbon. Then when you do get into stages three and four, you have uh, better maintenance plans, you involve the FM team, um, and you, you, uh, um, so you're, you're ready for the building when it's up and running. Um, at that critical stage, the commissioning stage, that you actually bring the FM team involved and the design team and the contractors working in collaboration to do that uh, commissioning so that uh, and the training happens at the same time. Uh, a very rich opportunity to really learn from, uh, the, what the buildings are and to, to put them into um, proper commissioning, both operational commissioning day one, and seasonal commissioning, the 12, first 12 months or even 24 months to get that building up and running for every condition that it's likely to, to experience. Nearly finished. So the, the other thing we're, we advise is, is um, having a strategic plan as, as an FM. I imagine a lot of the um, facility management is contracted out to companies, but uh, whether you as the client should retain some expertise in-house to manage that client. How often will you bid it out? Are you resilient in terms of people? How often has, have you kind of, um, uh, ha has the knowledge of how to maintain a building being unique to a person and that person then is not very sharing of that information? So have you a resilient strategy for ensuring that maintenance is both uh, resilient of people change and able to bid out and get competition? Um, not just delegating the whole responsibility to another company and then ending up dependent on them. So having a strategy for that towards the end as well as a client. And then post-occupancy, uh, are, we, are we monitoring our buildings? This is becoming much more pervasive now with smart meters, especially at domestic level. And that's going to be a lot of change. It's going to be very transparent what buildings are working well and what not in years to come so that the whole thing becomes more transparent. So that's that's it for me, really. Those three are the three main points I, I picked out of the, all the points we cover in that short course. We'll be running that short course again in uh, um, uh, when we have a, enough on people on the waiting list. So we ran it once in May with about 750 people on it. Ran it again in June with 1,150 people on it, and it's been very uh, good, very good ratings. Um, Michael, I think, was on it at one stage as well. So. Um, if you want to link to me, I, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn and there's a group actually on LinkedIn as well where I've posted up a lot of the paperwork. Again, I've had a thousand people really uh, engaging uh, and so a lot of crowdsourced information. It's very interesting to see what a large group of people think about all of these issues relating to sustainability. And I've even, I'm going to put in a, a little survey for you as well. There's 136 people in here. So I'd like to see what, what, what you think of what we're talking about. And again, we'll share that information around so that you're not just getting uh, you know the opinion of three people up here, uh, but you're you're seeing what um, what you as a group will get as well. So I'll, I'll share that around, over the, and uh, hopefully you'll find that useful. So I hope that was okay. Um, yeah, that I, was, I think that, it might be a minute over. 
just about that was no that was uh, that was that was excellent uh, okay. uh patrick um i i've got got one quick uh, question for you but again just a reminder to the audience please um please do uh, keep sending uh, your your questions in um uh, to, to the speakers patrick you, you mentioned about the, the move to all all electric on yes. some previous discussions we've we've been having it at fusion uh, one of our previous presenters mentioned about uh, hydrogen gas and I, I just wondered in in terms of that I mean do you think so that there is I, prospect that the uh, you know rather than completely getting rid of the gas uh, as a means of transporting energy on. gas is, is amazing it contains a lot of energy and I mean before we had natural gas we used to make gas out of coal in, in, in towns, the town gas, as it was called. Um, mm. So it's just as a means of moving energy through a building, because it's, it's medium level energy and you're going down to heat, it's very efficient than having to go up to electricity, which is, uh, if you know your entropy, is, is actually a tough thing to, to um, justify. Uh, but the answer to your question is, it, 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 where do we get the hydrogen? It's kind of a bit mm. like uh, nuclear fusion. It's always 20 years away, you know? Um, yeah. So if we don't have a sustainable source of hydrogen, then it's only a theory and it's not a practical solution. Whereas we do have MVHR, we do have heat pumps, we do have high efficient buildings. They are practical proven solutions that we can just get on and do now. And and uh, and I think, you know, maybe hydrogen will come and ser serve a place. If we have excess electricity, we can use that to generate hydrogen, but it's such an inefficient process that I uh, I think, um, uh, it would be foolish to to wait for that as a solution, and I think it's um, the move to electric is inevitable at this stage. I'm afraid. Yeah, excellent. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for that. And again, uh, to the audience, uh, please please do keep uh, your questions uh, questions c coming in. So, gonna gonna hand over um, now to, um, uh, to, uh, to 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 AJ. Hopefully, AJ, you can uh, keep uh, uh, keep hold of the. Um, uh, the, the the presentation and um, yeah that's uh, that, that's great so over over to you great well good afternoon everybody um, uh, thank you for inviting me to this presentation hopefully I've got hold of this now and we can uh, move us on um, so I'm going to be talking to you about um, retrofitting social housing stock or as we like to call it I wouldn't have wanted to start here. Um, I'm uh, AJ East, I'm a divisional director for a company called MySpace. We're a um, specialist in the social housing sector in terms of delivering uh, new build housing and uh, refurbishment, predominantly focused on a zero carbon, so passive house for new build and um, a range of uh, retrofit um, energy efficient solutions um, in terms of that refurbishment marketplace. We're part of a wider privately owned construction group based in the southwest of England and South Wales. So that's enough of the sale. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I'm going to talk to you about. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the case for change, the pro some proposals, technologies and next steps. I'm going to try and do all of that and follow Patrick's lead of doing that in 20 minutes. So he set the bar high. So the case for change, what I'm going to talk about um, is contained within a lot of government um, documents, the Climate Change Act, the Clean Growth Strategy, um, and as Patrick said, a lot of um, client or a lot of local councils now have declared a climate emergency and committed to decarbonisation by a certain timescale. So people like the Welsh Government have just um, committed to decarbonising their 250,000 social housing units by 2030. Um, but for me, one of the most shocking statistics um, that uh, I've come across is that 12% of households in England are in fuel poverty. Um, and in social housing and private rented is even worse than that, up to almost 20% of people are now in fuel poverty. So um, decarbonisation is not just about um, reducing carbon, it's actually addressing something which I think is an absolute travesty in this day and age. Um, and new build housing will make a, a difference to the, um, the stock we have in 2050, but the majority of the buildings that um, are going to be around in 2050 are already here now. And, and as Patrick said, um, we need to start building now um, to um, decarbonise now, not for the future, otherwise we're just going to have another 5,000 or 5 million properties that we're going to have to retrofit 
um, as well as the ones I've already got to do. Um, so, as we say, the re why, uh, why is the government looking at um, domestic housing? Well, 30% of energy use in, in the country is, comes from domestic and predominantly from heat and hot water. Um, there's also an issue around security of supply. Gas um, is a very efficient uh, method of fuel, but we are now a net importer of, of gas um, and we've got, and that is really causing a problem in security of supply. Um, and with, you know, we are in a situation where within 24 hours, in certain cases, we are on the verge of running out of gas in this country at times. So security supply is a big issue, moving to electric, whether that be renewably produced or whether that's produced by nuclear power, however it's produced, uh, means that we're in control of our own destiny. Um, so today you would have seen the government announcing measures around um, investing in energy efficiency, and there's a lot of pressure coming from people like CBI, Construction Leadership Council, New Economics Foundation um, on um, pushing low carbon as a vehicle to tackle recession. So if you haven't already seen it, there's a paper that was printed yesterday or came out yesterday called the Green Stimulation, Green Stimulus for Housing. It's got some really good stuff, uh, really good e information on why um, retrofitting existing housing stock is the way to move this um, country out of recession and investing in a post-COVID-19 uh, industry. So this just gives you a little bit of a scale of the problem we face uh, in this country with um, uh, less than 10% uh, of our properties in an EPC A or B rating. That means we've got a considerable amount of stock to get to zero carbon over the next sort of 20, 30 years. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about is a one of the projects that we've been involved with, um, which is an ERDF uh, funded program here in the southwest. Um, we've been involved in lots of different uh, energy efficient projects, whether they be Enerfit, Zebcat, um, Energy Sprong, all sorts of all sorts of different projects. So I'm going to show you a little bit of the learning we've uh, had from this particular project. As it says there, three registered providers. Exeter City Council, North Devon Homes and Sanctuary Home Housing, um, delivering um, a full retrofit programme for 16 properties, with a further 100 possibly to co carry on afterwards. So what is the principle? The principle is very much around fabric first, it's off-site manufacture, micro generation and storage, so generating energy on site and storing it in a battery, low carbon heat, hot water generation, heat recovery, um, creating nearly net, nearly net zero homes, NZ, um, and minimal time on site, using the method of savings to pay off the capex. Uh, and no doubt, one of the questions we'll get asked uh, later is how much. Uh, and so I'll cover that for you now. About eighty thousand pounds a unit. Um, and one of the things that's in the green housing, the green stimulus for housing paper is that does include VAT at 20%. So why are we paying that at 20% on this type of work? I have no idea. If we want to encourage people to do it, we've got to cut that to 5% or zero. So this just gives you a little graph. These, these slides will be made available. So this graph gives you a little bit of an indication of what the energy balance is. So the, um, the energy that is um, produced by the property is matches that that's um, consumed by the property. So you'll see an energy sprung retrofit is in, in balance with what you would see for a new build um, uh, passive house scheme as well. So what do they look like? Well, this is what I'm sure you're going to want to see. This is a um, one of the properties. This is down in uh, Torquay or Paynton, down on the south coast of Devon. Um, four units um, in a sort of 1960s type um, building, uh, cavity fill, pretty fuel inefficient, um, some real problems with the actual overall design of the building. Not not uncommon to a lot of the social housing I've seen in the 35 years I've worked in this sector. Um, uh, and that's why I've got no hair, as you can see, if you can still, if you can see the webcam here. Um, and then below the, the conceptual design of what we came up with, how do we address some of those um, uh, 
uh, sort of building uh, inefficiencies in terms of the flat roof, how do we insulate, how do we make it look a bit more uh, attractive from the curbside. Um, so that was the conceptual design. And then this is some pictures of what this looks like in actual occupation. You can see um, that we've straightened uh, or we've taken out the flat roofs. Um, we've um, got a, we're halfway through putting the um, external cladding solution, which was an off-site manufactured frame uh, by a company called Mauer, one of the partners we worked with on this project. On the left-hand side there, we've got an energy enclosure, which holds the um, ground source heat pump, the um, thermal store and the battery pack. And in this next drawer, in this picture, we can see um, the outline of the PV array that's gone on the roof um, to deliver the uh, micro generation uh, electric production for the properties. So we've said the increased capex um, reduces um, the operating cost. So in this case, with the the energy sprung with the ZEBCAP project, we have to guarantee the energy performance of the, um, of the design that we have developed as a contractor. So it's, it's a very different way of contracting. Normally as a contractor, what we get is a design that's procured, is produced by somebody else and will be asked to just install. In this particular case, what we were asked to do was to put together the design team and come up with a solution to deliver the um, energy performance. And not only do we have to design it, we have to guarantee that performance as well. So it does really focus your attention on making sure that the, um, the performance gap that we tend to have with buildings is dramatically reduced because if the energy, if our building doesn't deliver the performance that we're required to, we actually have to pay the resident the, uh, the difference in the energy, the energy they use. So um, it's really helped us to, to drive our design concept on. Um, the capital replacement savings and repair savings all go towards the model to make it work. But what it does is it brings forward all of that capital expenditure into one big lump. Um, and also the, um, the program is uh, utilised as a comfort charge or comfort plan, which is charged to the resident. So the resident actually pays off some of that um, investment in the property that they live in. It does future-proof the stock um, in terms of decent homes too, or whatever's going to come from the government in terms of some sort of social housing legislation in terms of energy performance. Um, and what we have is some, um, some really useful information now on um, the increase in the asset value. So you do spend a significant amount of money, but what we're seeing or what the evidence would demonstrate is that it produces about 30 to 40,000 pounds worth of increased asset value which could be leveraged in future funding. So just a quick model there to show the difference in the operating model. Um, traditional model, lower capex, higher operating cost, higher whole life cost. The alternative model that we're talking about here is a higher capex at the front, smaller operating cost, um, some revenue income, which results in a whole uh, lot of smaller whole life cost for the, the overall building. The, the problem we've always found with clients is they go, yeah, really understand that, great model, I haven't got the money. I can't free up that sort of level of money to be able to invest in our stock. So just a little indication there of the slight change in how that uh, comfort plan and that energy plan works in terms of a revised model under this um, energy sprung model. So what are the next steps? Well, we're still monitoring the um, solution. We're not quite, if we had something that you may have heard of called COVID-19, that stopped us finishing this particular project. So we're in the final stages of completing these uh, ERDF programs um, across Devon. Um, so we're now monitoring the behavior of residents, how they're working with the technology that we've installed and how we're tracking the benefits. Um, we're also developing with a partner, a, an artificial intelligent platform, which will help to monitor and manage the, the energy within the home and also to help the resident manage all of this technology that we're putting into the building. And how we integrate it, what we've found is a lot of the technology that we're putting together has got different methods of talking uh, to it, to use different platforms. So having one shared platform that manages all of that technology as well as helping a resident to, to manage their own behaviour is something that we're really looking at. Still got to develop the off-site solution so it becomes a bit more efficient. Um, 
and we need volume to do that. One of the key things that when Patrick was talking about earlier was about the increased cost. Part of the increased cost for the contractor is if we're not doing the same thing all the time, it becomes different. If we stop, start, stop, start, that's what becomes expensive. So there's a very quick roundup. Um, that was the project that we have been involved with. What I wanted to share with you very quickly was maybe a slightly different solution, maybe something that might uh, work um, differently with the way that we do um, projects within the social housing sector. Um, whole house retrofit may be right for certain projects, but um, in certain clients, in certain situations, what we're finding is a step-by-step -step approach may be a better way of tackling that problem by taking a bit of a time and fitting it with the, the component replacement programs that we're used to. So three steps to decarbonisation. Why? Well, it fits with um, existing housing and provides asset management. It almost uh, eliminates or certainly reduces the, the big lumps of capital that are required at the front end. So it will help to reduce that funding or support required. It means that we can reduce carbon quicker. The one thing we've found with doing whole house retrofit programs is they tend to take a lot, a lot of planning. And because of the, the huge amounts of impact in terms of the residents, there's a lot of things that we need to think about. And we often end up taking out um, elements or components that weren't at their end of their life. It's like changing the tires on the car when you've only done 10,000 miles on them. So if we can come up with a solution that quickly deploys energy um, generation and storage, they're quite quick to install. And what it does is that will help to flatten out the demand of electricity. Um, and then I know that from speaking to the district network operators, that's something that's really, really attractive. Um, and also it demonstrates an immediate action in terms of decarbonisation. And doing things step by step, I'm a, I am think, are really important by, if you take a boiler out, put a heat pump in, it will, that will immediately increase the cost of residence if you haven't addressed things like the fabric, because um, gas is a really cheap um, method of fuel, um, and whilst uh, heat pumps are really efficient, if we they don't work particularly well where you a leaky building that's thermally inefficient and the air, the air, the air tightness is poor. So energy provision, we've talked about using micro generation storage, AI technology, we're working, we're looking and working with some partners to look at a funded power purchase agreement that will reduce the cost of um, energy to, uh, to residents by about 30%, so compared to what they would buy that off the grid. Um, and also with the AI technology that would be installed, that piece of kit, it would also help to reduce their overall energy consumption in the home. So we're looking at that, and our early um, estimation is that's going to that will reduce electric consumption by about um, 45 to 50 percent, and can be deployed as part of other work. So if you're doing a roofing program, you've got a scaffold up, it can quickly be deployed and put in as part of that program. Fabric, really important part of the energy jigsaw puzzle in my mind, um, and often the bit that gets a little bit overlooked. You know, we like to look at sort of um, uh, uh, the what I would call the green bling, the PV and the heat pumps and all that. But if you don't tackle the fabric, then those things don't don't work as well as they could. So um, we've sometimes looked at triple. We've done lots of triple glazing. Um, but I think if you, we, we from Amal, the, that cost benefit analysis is that double glazing, um, if designed well with the right um, uh, detailing around those cold bridging, um, can be a cost effective solution. Uh, spending that extra money on triple glazing can often, you know, you know, is almost double the cost of putting in a double glazing. Increasing the loft insulation, looking at the floor insulation, the ground, the slab, the insulate, the slab, looking at how we can do that, but thinking about how that insulation works in terms of those BD building details and doing it as part of the other. If you're going to be replacing, you're putting a scaffold up, think like to replace the roof, think about the windows, are the components, are the windows going to be replaced? If so, Combine those um, elements together to get in to get efficiency. It's a bit like the meal deal down at McDonald's. You know, you get the burger and the fries and the drink. You you pay five pound for them, but if you buy them all individually, they're seven pounds. So you get a little deal by by combining those work streams together. 
And then the final step is that move to uh, electric heating and hot water. What we've found from um, the, the programs that we've done is that um, the heat pump is a really, really good um, piece of kit. But in a lot of cases, once we've tackled the insulation and the micro generation, the, the actual heat demand is so low that we don't necessarily need a heat pump. And we've found that um, ground source heat pumps are, are quite um, uh, expensive to install. Yes, there's RHI to come back and pay off that investment. But also what we've found is that they can be they're quite um, messy to put in. You know, they, they take quite a bit of time in terms of trenching and boreholing and actually getting the services into the building. So we're now looking at saying, actually, could we deploy having a much easier installation solution, like an infrared heating solution? Um, and again, looking at hot water through smart cylinders and um, using that AI technology to manage that energy consumption. And, you know, the removal of gas appliances, when we have the opportunity to remove, if, if our properties are ready and gone through those steps, let's look at taking out the gas then. Don't take the gas out before you've done the, the, other, the other steps because it just becomes expensive. So, in conclusion, I think I've run a little bit over time, but in essence, uh, in conclusion, I would say the, the challenges for the sector are not about whether we are going to do this or not, because that's, that's without question what we're going to do. The drive is to get to all social housing units to an EPC rating of C by 2030. And my, the danger in that, in my mind, is that we don't think about what the next steps on our past part after that. So let's think about what we're going to do with our assets, think about how all of the elements that we're going to do fit together as an overall solution. And that's what will deliver a zero energy building. Thank you. Thank, thank, thanks, AJ. Um, yeah, the, the, absolutely fascinating. Just, just, just a couple of quick questions before I move on to uh, Michael. And again, thank you uh, to the audience for, uh, uh, for your continued um, uh, answer, asking of the questions. We, we're also uh, going to have a, a sort of roundup uh, towards the end, but but just 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 a couple of uh, quick ones. What, one was about the procurement route um, in, in terms of the project that, that you've talked about, and then the, the other is around, and I think you to some extent, I think you probably did address it. How are you factoring in thermal comfort issue uh, and 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 any issues around potentially overheating? So if you could just address Susan and, and then you know, one or two of the other questions uh, we're, we're going to pick up uh, towards the end. Okay, good question. So the procurement route for um, ZEBCAT was a, a two-stage process. Um, first stage being conceptual design and then the second stage being effectively a, a full-scale solution. Um, and I, I think that, you know, that it, certainly the way that um, uh, a good procurement route to use, again, I also certainly advocate the use of Fusion 21's um, procurement route. I think that the key thing for any part, any procurement exercise is, is finding a partner uh, and supply chain who've got the expertise and experience to be able to deliver these type of projects. And I'm not saying you should be using MySpace or anybody else, but I think it's you've got to find the people who've got that collaborative attitude, people who you can work with to develop a solution because these projects are challenging and you need to have a collaborative attitude to be able to make them work. Yeah. Um, and the second part about um, overheating, yeah, it's a really good point, really good point. Um, I think we've, in terms of, uh, we've you to looked at um, how we've um, looked at shading and how we've looked at cooling um, and the heat pumps can be used to cool the buildings as well as um, uh, to heat them. And I think it's going to be a bigger issue. The, the overheating of buildings is a bigger issue than probably the heating of buildings in the future. Um, so the MVHR that we've used, um, we've used uh, localised solutions um, rather than putting centralised MVHR in these projects. We, we have on a retrofit project put centralised MVHR in. And it, it, in, it's just not practical in occupied properties, trying to get um, ducting and um, the, the centralised system into, into occupied buildings, which are often cluttered and difficult to get in. So we've, our approach has been really about minimising the, um, the internal work that we undertake and trying to do everything externally as much as we can. And in a COVID 
um, environment, that's even more important, I think. Well, if we can limit that that interaction. Okay, yeah. thanks. Okay, so uh, moving then on to our final uh, presentation. And as I said at the beginning, Michael McGowan is Sustainability uh, Manager at um, uh, Riverside. So over, over to you, Michael. Thanks, Andrew, um, and thanks to Patrick and AJ for the presentations. Um, it's been great, or it's great to share this platform with two people who are advancing this agenda within the sector. So um, I've certainly learned more again today. So thank you for your presentations. Um, start with a little bit about myself before going into the presentation, which is um, talking about how we overcome cultural and behavioural barriers to achieve a net zero carbon strategy. And the strategy that we probably tried to advocate recently is around the power of positive disruption. So whilst that sounds like quite an emotive and bold term, hopefully during the presentation you'll see um, some of the things that we hope to implement as a um, sector really to try and advance the challenge that we've got ahead of us. So I'm Michael McGowan, I am the Sustainability Manager for the Riverside Group. I've been in post since November 2018, but I've worked for Riverside since 2009. Before that, I was working in private practice as a building surveyor for 12 months. Previous to that, I graduated from the Bill John Moores with a master's in commercial building surveying. Since I've joined the asset team in 2010, um, I've delivered around £30 million pounds worth of retrofit and renewable projects. And in my current role, the team that I'm working within, I've secured funds in four and are in the process of delivering just under £10 million pounds of Fabric First and Affordable Warm programmes across our asset portfolio. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about Riverside for those who don't know. Um, we started or were formed in 1928 as Liverpool Improved Houses. We had 15 homes at that time in Swan Street in Liverpool. And our aim at that point was making houses of housing affordable to those most in need. Today, Riverside is a value-driven organisation with a strong sense of social responsibility and a firm line in accountability to our customers. We own and manage around 60,000 properties and work across over 160 local authorities, providing a vast range of services across all tenure types. In relation to sustainability, we have, by our own admission, been a little bit passive in the past few years, and I don't think we are alone within the housing sector in relation to this. But now we are embracing this issue and we are making firm plans for the future. So, as I say, we have been a little bit passive, but in the past eight months, I've seen a massive increase in the discussion and action on sustainability across our group. Whilst my role is primarily, well, based within the asset services department. We have been having a lot of discussions at group level recently, and we formed a group of climate champions who have both the subject matter interest and also the influence within our business areas to instigate change. We are focusing on key th five key areas which we think will cover most aspects of our operations. They are property, which will include existing and new homes, plus all of our offices, technology, transport and travel, supply chain, and then finally people, and that'll be for both colleagues and customers. Within this group, we're aiming to instigate a number of operational and behavioral projects to enable sustained change as we embark upon our climate responsibility journey. We've also just released a new corporate plan and climate responsibility is a key theme that runs throughout all of the objectives within that. So when I was preparing for this session, I thought I'd better brush up on my terminology. Um, and I actually thought I should research the term strategic planning. I found five key phases within that, which are to clarify your vision, gather and analyze information, formulate a strategy, implement your strategy, and then evaluate and control. And that sounds very simple when it's written down as five succinct points. But all of these will be steps that we all recognise. And when we think about it in relation to our net zero carbon strategies, there are clear barriers across all of those. So the purpose of the presentation today is to talk about the barriers that we're all going to face in achieving this shared goal. And I can't get enough across the point that this is a shared goal. 
with all change, we will all face barriers as we try to implement our strategies in relation to climate responsibility. For the purpose of the presentation today, I'm going to focus on key three specific barriers, and they are leadership, either governmental or organisational, financial resources, and people. So leadership shapes the decision-making culture of countries or businesses. Good leadership can inspire creativity and action, whilst poor leadership can make action difficult or impossible. And again, I'm sure we both, or we've all experienced both of those activities. At this point, there is simply not being, despite the news from today, um, there is simply not enough being done by governments across the globe. In the UK, there is a, a, currently a lack of support of national policy frameworks. And I believe that guidance and legislation from central governments is key across the globe to know where, you know, where we're going to be going. If you think about the point that, or the discussion Andrew and Patrick had earlier on about hydrogen versus air source, you know, there is still that lack of clarity in relation to what our decarbonisation strategy is going to be. So, you know, the, the sooner we can arrive at a, a, you know, a vision statement, so to speak, the sooner we can start to get on with actually investing our money and time and energy into, pardon the pun, but into the um, this this aim which we've got. So, as per the cartoon which you've used, um, in 2015, we saw what appeared to be a landmark event with the Paris Agreement. Yet in 2019, the UN Emissions Report reported an 11% increase in global emissions in the decade running from 2010. We are now in year one of what is being labelled globally as the decade of action. Now is the time for leaders to lead. Financial resources is a huge barrier for us. Um, again, there's been some allocation today, which I'll touch on in a later slide, but it's currently conservatively estimated that 30 trillion will be wiped off the economy if we continue on our current trajectory in relation to global warming. Funding is needed to improve opportunities across our sector and beyond. However, we can't hide behind this as a reason not to act. In fact, failing to act now will actually restrict businesses' capacity to attract the funding needed to, to achieve our net zero targets. AJ touched on it before, but the cost of retrofitting our homes is staggering. Many, many housing associations are currently scoping plans to improve the energy performance of our stock. And that's got an average cost at the moment estimated to be about £25,000 per property. And that is just to bring it up to band C. Um, I am delighted to hear the point that AJ made before, but that point that I've just made actually, it evidences how, to, how easy it is for us to get lost on the road to net zero. I go to many sessions and many meetings and we talk about band C as the destination. It's literally the step on a journey. You know, to hear AJ say that before gives me so much confidence. And you know, it's great to see that there are people within the sector who are tuned into that fact. Um, people, as with all change, for me, the biggest barrier to transition to net zero is going to be people. Um, and I know Patrick talks about there's a specific section of his five week course which talks about uh, collaboration, but that comes back to the point he made earlier around skills, knowledge, and behaviors. For me, there's still a lack of appreciation of the scale of the risk of climate change poses to us, but also for the opportunity presented to us by transitioning to a zero or low carbon economy. We've got to be mature in our appreciation, though, that of the challenges that people face, whether that be understanding, economic or habitual. I think education and support is key, whether that be for our colleagues, friends, families and customers. We all make, we all make daily choices which can contribute to achieving our goals. I'll be honest, my own considerations have changed massively since taking my role in 2000, 2018, but then more so since we had our son in 2017. There is a, a piece around the legacy of the decisions we make today, you know, and how that's going to impact the generations of tomorrow. It would be very simple for me to talk about the barriers or obstacles that lie ahead of us. And to be fair, I think I fell into this trap when I've presented in the past. But whilst I want to acknowledge them, I also want to talk about how we all have the power to positively disrupt these constraints which we find ourselves working within. So leadership, this can come in many guises, whether that be politicians, activists, actors, 
innovators. Um, you all attending today are leading by example and will hope and will hopefully be able to use some of the information from today to advance your own discussions. If you don't feel like you've got the direct influence or the direct ability to influence, find someone who has, find someone who's got that shared vision or shared purpose and work with them to get your points heard. Align yourself to those people and lead the discussions with those around you. Get the leaders in the business to ask the right questions and ask them the right questions. But more importantly, I think it's important, it's key that we don't people, we don't tell people what to do. Instead, leverage their curiosity to get them involved and grow that band of voices because, you know, the, the, as you'll see with some of the things that have been going on globally, you know, it started with one person who, you know, went on strike on a, didn't go to school on a Friday and then we had a, you know, a, a multinational army of people doing it, you know, whether you agree with the, um, the way in which it was done or some of the strategies which it deployed, the fact that it heightened it into the public consciousness is, is unquestionable. So financial, financial resources, as we say, um, wonderfully timed on, on the back of the, um, the announcement today from the Chancellor. Um, and we are seeing shoots of optimism that the tide is slowly turning on this. Um, the announcements in relation to a series of green measures as part of a COVID-19 recovery plan have come out today. Um, we've got to take what we can get really, haven't we, at the moment? Whether you actually or whether any of us think that the allocation is enough, I'll leave you to judge, but ultimately it is progress. Um, I think the point that AJ made before around VAT um, on energy efficiency measures was a great one. And, you know, it should be at 5% or lower. You know, if you think about adaptations, we get zero rated um, VAT on, on those installs. For me, um, we've just seen the announcement today from the Chancellor that he's actually dropping VAT on hospitality to 5% across accommodation, attractions and eating out. But we've just announced a £3 billion green, efficient, green energy efficiency scheme, but with no alteration in the VAT. It sometimes just still doesn't feel like the left hand's talking to the right in some of these policy decisions that are being made. Um, at COP26, I think we're going to see, uh, in, you know, it's being moved back to next November now, but I think we're going to see a huge restructuring of the financial markets to ensure that all lending is contributing to a net zero future. Pension funds will be driven by ESG investments. Insurance markets and premiums will be impacted by measures in place to combat climate change. The work which is being done by the Task Force for Climate Related Disclosures is going to catapult the need and awareness from boards and CFOs around risk, but more, more importantly, again, the opportunities presented by this expected reset. Organisations and governments need to plan and act now to be ready to, for the opportunity that will soon be presented to us. We can start now. There are low regrets investments which can be made into a fabric first approach across our house and stock that will in no way be to the detriment of our long term ambitions. So, you know, as we've all touched on today, let's make sure that these, pro these properties are as efficient as they possibly can be before as the AJ rightly points we go to the sexy stuff around you know solar PV air source heat pumps etc there's no point having all those things if you if you put your building's absolutely poor and um, or poor in relation to its its heat um just onto people then again um I think Ev, this is completely up to us all we all have the capacity to make a different choice, whether that be, you know, something as simple as going to Starbucks or Costa with a reusable cup. Um, that starts your con that your that starts your decision making. We all have the capability to support behaviour change, whether that's for ourselves or our colleagues or any other people around us. And as I mentioned in one of the earlier slides, every single action counts. We have the ability to positively disrupt the parameters that we're working within, and we should all make a conscious effort to do that. I'm conscious of time, so probably why my um, tone has sped up quite a bit in the last couple of slides. So, um, so the future. Some of you may have seen this um, cartoon on social media in the past couple of days. I actually saw it posted by Ali Sheridan, um, and I, I've used a quote which she actually posted with this on LinkedIn. And she said, the only constant is change. COVID-19 has shown us what's possible in terms of mass and rapid change in response but it has come as a, at a cost. We need to take these learnings forward as we prepare for what comes next in terms of climate and biodiversity action. In the tragic times that we find ourselves in, 
we have a real opportunity for sustained change. The comparisons between risk and resilience in relation to COVID-19 and climate change are unquestionable. Every one of us has demonstrated personal responsibility during this period, and we have all adapted quickly and robustly to the new norms. In the near future, it's simply not going to be enough to have plans for net zero. Businesses are going to have to demonstrate our preparedness for climate shocks, as well as being biodiversity positive in our actions. There is a huge journey to go on, and I'm simply aware of that. And, you know, I'm not trying to be too preachy about the things that I'm saying. We've all got this opportunity to influence, and it can be with a very simple, simple decision. So on that note, I will leave you with my final slide. Quite simply, the longer we wait, the bigger the challenge is going to be. If you had a leak in your home, you would not wait until the ceiling come through. You would find that leak, you would diagnose that repair, and you would fix it as quickly as you could. If we haven't started yet, let's all try and make a start. We need individual, organisational, societal connections to be established to make this work. There's so much work going, on, good work going on out there in the sector at the moment. You've only got to listen to the two gentlemen who, who, who were before me today to hear about the expertise and work that's taken place out there. Partnerships and peer learning is absolutely invaluable, and I'm so grateful for. Fusion 21 putting this together today to give us three the opportunity to share our experience and hopefully um, pass those on and make some contacts off the back of this section. Um, if anyone does want to share any best practice or collaborate in any way, any way, please feel free to get in touch with me via email or on LinkedIn. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, 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 Michael. That was uh, really, uh, really very, uh, very insightful. And, and, and again, I, I couldn't. Uh, couldn't agree more with uh, with 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 your uh, with with your comments and, and your, your 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 closing comments. Just a just just a couple of uh, questions, and and I mean I'm going to throw this open to the whole panel, and and we've got about another ten minutes. So please, audience, uh, if you do have any further questions, um, uh, come uh, you know please please do uh, please do post them. Um, but a sort of general question, and, and from from one or two of the things, and and it's about what I would describe as sort of uh, customer confidence in this year. You know, I mean, I did talk about hydrogen gas, but we have been used to, you know, the old gas boiler, the old radiators, uh, uh, and so on, and and the whole thing around uh, customer behaviour. What does the panel think are the ways in which we can sort of start to influence that customer uh, behaviour so as that they all get um, uh, these solutions? Uh, let me let me start with you, Patrick. Well, I mean the the dash for gas back in the 1980s was showed showed we how we moved on away away from coal burning onto gas in the first place. So you know we, we, it's not like we haven't done it before, um, and and in some ways. Um, there's a lot of benefits to moving on to things like all electric systems, MVHR and heat pumps. Uh, but but AJ made a very good point that those systems alone are not good enough. You have to improve the fabric you're building to make them feasible. Um, but there's a lot of psychology out there in terms of and, and economics in terms of how do you instigate change uh, down to even the level of, of, you know, we have an army of people who main, maintain boilers out there, but they're not transferring onto heat pumps as quickly as we would need so retraining down to that level to installers to procurement lines the, the whole thing you know there was a very interesting study done recently looking at just a uh, high density housing like apartment housing for cities and they looked at all the different types and they actually ended up with um an, uh, a package unit mvhr with a with a with an air source um a heat pump that you can get going, put through a wall, and they said this was by far the winning option for high density living because it, it you can buy it as a packet and it's easy to install. And it, it talked all about the social changes of things like ground source heat pumps and stuff like AJ talked about, all the little things that can go wrong on site. And it's still almost from an insta, uh, installation point of view um, as a solution, the the um, the air source heat pump with with a uh, exhaust air heat pump, uh, the air air source, sorry. MVHR with exhaust source heat pump package unit 
was the uh, runaway winner of the of the 14 or 15 different systems they looked at just for those kind of high apartment blocks uh, in city centres. So um, it was a very it was in the November issue of the SIBC Journal, which is free to read online that that report was in. And what impressed me most wasn't the kind of technical kilowatt hour calculation; it was the practical, you know, how would the, how would you actually buy them and install them evaluation that formed part of it as well. That was very interesting. Yeah. Okay. A A AJ, again, just 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 to remind you, in, in terms of that focus on customer behaviour and 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 you know, getting that getting that buy-in. What what what's your what's your experience? It, it's <clears throat> it's the bit that's probably most overlooked, in my opinion. That <laughs> we focus, as Patrick just said, on sexy bits of kit that uh, we pat ourselves on the back about how clever we are. Often we forget that it's people who've got to use it. Um, I can only go on my own experience uh, to start with to say for the last 20 years of marriage, I've tried to get my wife to understand how the room stat works in our house and that it's just a switch and that it doesn't actually change the heat of the, that goes into the radiators and I've had no success there. So I think what they, isn't they saying you've got to do something 200 times to change a, um, to change a habit. And um, so what we have done, what we have been doing for quite some time is um, is utilising that tenant liaison officer as an advocate, because what we've often found is that when you have technical people explaining to non-technical people how something works, they get frustrated because they, they, they talk in a language that people don't understand and um, it's simple to them. Um, and the the tenant liaison officer creates a um, an advocacy role for that resident throughout the course of that um, project. So why shouldn't they maintain that advocacy? It doesn't matter if it's a year down the road or two years down the road. It's it's about helping them to understand how this different technology is going to work for them. Um, so the other part of that little bit of the jigsaw puzzle for me is about being able to see what's happening. In real in real life, so if you're able to be able to spot where the air source heat pump or the ground source is being turned on and off and turned on and off and off again, because that's the bit that makes it expensive. It works in a different way to the way that people are used to. It sort of it builds up and it it's left at a low background heat. And um, when you use it like that, it's really efficient. When you start turning it on off on off on off, it uses lots of energy. So being able to identify that and have a platform that highlights that to you so you can take some um you can have some measures that can be um impacted you can start to contact the resident and say look you can see you're using more energy than we predicted we would you like us to come out and explain again how it's used um, blah, blah 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 that or the actual system has got that bit of a technology that helps helps them with it and you know that's the that's really what we've been developing is this this AI platform that really does some of that work for the resident. It helps manage the building in a different way rather than relying on them to do it. it also gives management information up the line to be able to monitor it. Yeah. But it's okay. clean, and, 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 that cultural bit is massive. Okay, and 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 Michael. Yeah, I'll I'll keep it brief. Um behavioural education it's it's absolutely massive both for our colleagues and for our customers um i've had a couple of conversations this week and one of the key um objectives that i'm going to set from my energy officer over the next 12 months is to come up with a some form of learning package or behavioral package for our customers in relation to this um, i've had some early conversations with some people who were doing unbelievable things in the sector such as sam granger up at 13 group around um some sort of collaboration with you know across different registered providers to come up with this and you know look at linking out to you know some of the higher education establishments and Patrick you know people like yourselves who've got unbelievable experience we'd welcome any involvement in that but for me you, you're probably going to get about 25 percent efficiency gain from actually teaching people how to either use the, the kit correctly or to you know not just whack the heating up and then open the window you know you've that you've got all that so education and engagement is absolutely key for us and you know the more we can join forces on that the better one 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 final question and, and then i'll s s sort of wrap up i mean we entitled this session a sort of roadmap to achieving uh, zero carbon and, and and panel sort of keep your uh, responses uh, brief because of time but will we get there patrick 
So the, the National Grid has actually issued a very interesting document uh, aimed at politicians where it outlines four scenarios over the next four, uh, 30 years to get to zero carbon based on policies we adopt now. So um, the, the actual changes we've had in the National Grid the last 10 years has been amazing. Uh, and that's actually given me hope. If you had asked me maybe five years ago, I would have been more skeptical. But when I've seen the, just how much rapid change has been in the national grid, the UK is now the biggest wind provider in the world. Uh, we've gone how many days now without burning coal? Um, and you look at the document that they set out and, and they, they, they gave four different scenarios for achieving zero carbon based on policies government should choose now. So um, I suppose the, the big ask is, is the complexity of the construction industry. Do we have the capacity to change and adapt? And and I, I think it, it needs enough people with enthusiasm, enough people to you know infect the rest and we get to a critical mass of around 60% and actually the rest will just get hoovered up. So I think it's it is possible, but but um yeah, I think I think the next 18 months is very telling. Um the, there's a short window there for the government to use this let's call it an opportunity that COVID has given to need to have to spend a lot of money to 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 kickstart the economy. If you look at the history of uh, downturns, they did. They, that's how you get motorways, and that's how you get massive infrastructure. Was was uh, government using that kind of um, downturn to kickstart economy? So I really think um, the next 18 months is a window. Is, is the answer I'm, I'm giving, Andrew? Yeah, excellent. Uh, quickly, AJ. Uh, I think it was, goes back to what Michael was saying earlier that we it, it, it we have to. It, it, there is no. There is no op, uh, other option, um, and I think my opinion is that we've just got to stop doing pilots. I'm going to do a ground source heat pump pilot. I'm going to do an air source heat pump pilot. I'm going to do an EWI. You know, this technology has been around for years and years and years. We just need to. What we need to do is get them into our programs, into our plans, into our how we look after our assets. So it's not. It, it, we don't need another separate bit aside from it. it just needs to be business as normal we need to get on with it now because the, the longer we leave it as michael says the bigger the problem we're storing up and then we'll end up like we did with decent homes with doing 20 30 thousand kitchens a, you know a month in and now all we've done is stored up a massive internal works program that's going to have a, a ramp up in five ten years time so we need to just, if we, the more we can make it a standard, a steady amount, get, make sure it's part of the strategy, make sure that we're replacing components, we're thinking about how we can make that more efficient, then we'll get there. And we will change. I remember probably, we all can remember 20, 30 years ago, you had a company car, what was the first thing that when you came in the office, as it got, we didn't have air conditioning then, for those of you who can't remember that, but as it got a CD player, how fast does it go? As it got leather seats? No one gave a monkey's how many miles to the gallon it did. No one even paid any attention to it. Now, someone gets a new car, how many miles to the gallon does it do? Is it a hybrid? Do you plug it in? How do you get it? You run on it's yeah. a change. That's what changes culture. That's what changes it once, and you'll see that. We need to get to that place with buildings. As soon as we do, all of a sudden, it will be moving in the right direction. And then, finally, and again, briefly, Michael. Yes. Um, <laughs> Excellent, thank you. <laughs> just it, depends how, it just depends how steep the curve is going to be. Yeah. Again, you know, going back to that point, the sooner we act, the, sooner, the, the, the less impactful and less steep that's going to be. You're going to, we've got to look at the decarbonisation of our homes and also, you know, how do we make electric um, vehicles more um, available to consumers because the price at the moment is, is outrageous. Um, but obviously that's on mass, isn't it? So uh, yeah. transport and travel and the decarboniz decarbonisation of the heat network will help us get there. Okay, I, 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 I want to sort of thank that there, there have been a few more questions, but we're sadly uh, running out of time. But I, I, I will, we will ask the panelists that, that those additional uh, questions, and, and we'll revert back to 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 you, the the, the audience, um, in, in over over the next uh, day or so. And w at the same time, we will also share um, the survey that, that that Patrick talked about, and above all, continue that collaboration, which I think is 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 vital. Um, uh, just 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 then, uh, finally, just a sort of little reminder in in terms of um, you know, Fusion is here to help. Uh, organizations uh, on this journey 
uh, we have specific uh, frameworks uh, in place that, that, that cover a, a lot of the uh, issues that are being talked about uh, here. So again, please do get in touch. And again, that sort of whole house, uh, you know, wider re regeneration. Again, that 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 can, that can be done. Uh, our heating and renewables framework, again, recently set up um, to cover uh, these uh, additional uh, items. So, you know, please uh, do come and, and speak to us. We are very keen as Fusion 21 to continue uh, this agenda, to continue this debate, as, as Patrick, Michael and, and, and AJ uh, said. And, you know, please you know, do get in touch. We, you know, we, we do want to continue to uh, inform and share uh, good practice in terms of what's what, what's what's going out. One sort of final prompt whilst we're on surveys, uh, we as Fusion 21 have launched our uh, annual uh, procurement trends survey. If you haven't yet had uh, the link, um, please go uh, to our website and, and complete that. It's an important part of what we do, finding out uh, what, what what's happening uh, in, in, in terms of the world of procurement. And again, particularly in the, the current environment, that's very important. So again, ju just finally uh, uh, to wrap up, we will uh, continue our, our series of, of, of webinars. We hope you uh, have enjoyed it. Uh, an actual round of applause from me to our speakers, Patrick, uh, AJ uh, and Michael. It's been a really, really interesting session. Thank you uh, to uh, our audience. Uh, we had uh, over a sort of 150 uh, at, at one point, which is which is really great uh, news. Um, we will be sending out a short survey after today, so please complete that because your views are very welcome. So again, thank you very much. Have a great rest of the day, and as ever, stay safe. Thanks and, and thank you, Andrew. Goodbye. Bye, Michael. Thanks. Bye, Jane. Bye, guys.